I think the last time, uh, Pastor Jose, that we spent really any time together was at GC Session, and I had the privilege of uh, carrying this guitar case as we walked across a number of city blocks in San Antonio, Texas. And one thing I can say about Pastor Jose is that the conversation was extremely intentional on his part to speak life into me with every step. And there was a lot of intentionality that he put into the words that he shared as we went through a hotel lobby after a hotel lobby after a hotel lobby, climbed stairs together, and got you to where you needed to be. And so thank you again for being here, letting God use you, and sharing and speaking life into this room of leaders. Thank you so much. It was all nice when it began, but I'm kind of worn out. You should stand in my spot. This is my seventh presentation. So I'm not complaining. I'm just telling you I understand. <laughs> we're, not any, we're not getting any younger, huh, you uh, veterans sitting out there. Remember how much energy we used to have? Back in our 30s, you know, I'm just getting started. Not anymore. <laughs> but, you know, this is only once in a long while. The union, praise the Lord for the vision of, of a division that mobilizes its union and conference leaders. And I just want to congratulate the leadership for its vision for this event. Have you been blessed? Yes. Amen. For our leaders. <laughs> and I want you to know... It's a tremendous honor for this servant to be here to mess with you unnecessarily, for uh, uncalled for uh, unnecessary roughness. And I'm, I'm going to tell you why I do this. I, I, I don't know when I'll ever see you again. For some of you, I'll get to see you again. And for others, this may be our last shot together. So I feel a certain urgency to give you as much as I can while we're together. I burn you out. I, I overload your circuits. Um, and analysts have told me you give us far too much information. Why do you do that? Because what you forget, your buddy will remember. And that's why I say, go tell somebody what you have seen. And in your conversation, you'll remember this part. And then that person will remember that part. And amidst all this overloading of circuits, suddenly something will explode and smoke will rise as it comes out of your left ear. So the notion is, these are intensives. For those of you who have degrees, you understand that language. For those of you who don't have a degree, you wish you didn't have to go through this again. And the beauty of this is that these summits are moments when you realize you're not alone. There are others who have like passions as you do. And, and you realize that you're into this for the long haul. Some of you have been doing this for decades. Others of you are just starting out, but you're looking around and say, this truly is a science. Pedagogia, we call it. Pedagogia, the science of educating children. They're not the church of tomorrow. Go to a church that's alive and is full of kids. It's a noisy place. We don't know what to do with all these kids. Amen. Go to a church that's dying. And all 15 elderly people will tell you that everything's organized and it starts and ends on time. No kids there. Now, I'm not criticizing. I'm just telling you. An exploding church is full of kids. And guess where you are? Leading them. I am truly humbled to stand before command that leads such an army. Uh, anyone who has served in the military here, you veterans, you know that a place, a location, cannot be declared secure until there are boots on the ground with a small arm. Once troops are standing there, you can declare a location secure. And at your churches, I look around here and I can say that if I go to your church on a given Sabbath, I'll find church shoes on the ground <laughs> with with weapons to secure. Amen. Remember, we are not wrestling against flesh and blood. We keep thinking we are. We keep drifting into thinking if only these liberals or these conservatives would stop it. We are not fighting against flesh and blood. Keep your eye on who the real enemy is. We are fighting principalities, 
the rulers of the darkness of this world. We, our enemy is Satan and his hosts of demons, not the liberals or the conservatives, not people for whom Christ died who really mess with our emotions. They are not the enemy. The enemy is Satan. But greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Any questions? Okay, I have you sufficiently frightened or bored. You know, he just keeps doing this stuff. What is hope? When you believe in something. First, you must believe. All things are possible to them that believe. If you lose hope, it's because you stop believing. If you stop believing, it's because you lost hope. They are synonymous. They are one and the same thing. Where are our kids today? Some of our kids lost hope because they stopped believing in our church. Why? Because they watch us fight over the dumbest things. And then we tell them they need to stay there. Then we're crying that they're gone. But God has put your boots on the ground. And that's going to bring our kids back, right? All four of you. Amen. And the rest of you, trust not in your own emotions. Today you're encouraged. Tomorrow you're totally discouraged and ready to give up. Today, you're ready to get back to the church and take care of business. Tomorrow, you're considering resigning from your position. Do not trust your emotions. One day, you're happy. Another day, you're sad. But trust in the call that God has given you. In spite of how you feel, he will go before you. For the work that we do is not human machination. It is not methods and techniques. Although those things are important, that is not what makes a ministry for children successful. It is the movement of the Holy Spirit, just as was promised. Amen. What is hope? When you believe in something. First, you must believe. But some of you are crying out, I believe, but help thou my unbelief. Scriptures are honest with us. We can believe and still doubt. I still harbor doubts in the back of my mind. I'm not ready. Amen. Welcome. Those of you who have been to combat know that you face impossible odds. 200 enemy soldiers pinning down 15 Americans. Impossible. But they have to never let go of their belief. Regardless of the impossibility of the situation, the Lord will intervene and bless the crew. We may lose one or two, but it's going to cost them. See, the power of belief is unmistakable. It's because you have hope. If I can hope in a losing team in the NFL that I know for a fact is not going to win the Super Bowl this year, but I am still a fan, don't badmouth my Washington Redskins. We're not going to win, but you watch. There's always next season. Here we are at the beginning of the season. Anyway, I still believe. What about our kids? We still believe. We don't lose hope. There are kids. Now, what is faith? Faith is a substance of what you hope for, which means faith is what you do. You believe. You've got hope. Go do it then. Don't just talk that you have faith in Jesus. Show me. We're all from Missouri. Show me. Don't talk to me about it. Show me what you mean. Faith is when we do it. Just like the Nike shoe company, they tell you, just do it. Like we say on the street, do it. What you waiting on us? Go do it. Hurry because the cops are coming. Go do it. Do it. Que tanto esperas? Go do it. We're Latino kids feeling right now. He's crazy, but I like him. Notice I keep repeating that. We need role models for every culture, don't we? I'm tired of our kids falling into gangs. I want Latino kids to say, look, we have a chance to make it also in ministry. 
I want Latino kids to say, I got hope. I want Latino parents sitting here tonight saying, my kids left the church. Mira, the Lord can bless our people también. Mira, valgame Dios. I know I'm different. Pray for me. Because I'm not changing. Someone said, aren't you a little bit direct? I go, yes, and I'm not going to apologize. I've tried apologizing too much. It starts to sound empty. Please accept my humanity and look into my heart. I'm trying to be as sincere as I can. Have you sensed the transparency? Be transparent like that with the kids. Don't hide your humanity. Please don't lie to them and tell them that Jesus gets sad when they behave that way. That's not true. Jesus is happy with them no matter how they behave. We'd have a very, very frustrated Jesus if that was true. God has a plan. Now, I'm going to ask you, what is love? What is love? It certainly is not my marriage. No, don't say that. But I know you're thinking it, a couple of you. You're looking at the floor. It didn't seem funny. To you. That, that was unnecessary. Okay, sorry. What is love then? A lawyer approached Jesus, a lawyer, and asked him a question. Which is the greatest commandment? He expected a legal analysis. And Jesus gave him what we would call a tertiary overview of the law. He said, you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And the second is like unto it. You will love your neighbor as yourself. And here is contained the law and the prophets. That was a legal analysis to end all legal analysis. I am not a lawyer, but I'm always involved with either writing legislation or interpreting. Sometimes we get sued, and I, I look at the, uh, the document, and if somebody here is a lawyer, I apologize. I know I'm just a preacher. Oh, this is frivolous. They're suing us for $1.2 million. They want to settle out of court for 35000 No, this is all. This is a waste of time. Don't worry about it. The Lord is with us. Are you a lawyer? No, I'm a pastor. <laughs> but I don't play one on TV. It's amazing when you do God's work, he gives you exactly what you need at the moment you need it. Amen. And then we all get called into court. We all testify. And sure enough, what do they propose? We can settle out of court for $35,000. Don't settle. They should, or, should have never come after the work of God. This one's frivolous. When we deserve it, let's own up to it and pay up. This one, they just want money out of it. They think we're a deep pocket. We're not. It would be nice if we had a lot of money. So from time to time, I'm in meetings where we're doing legal analysis of a document, of a policy. I, 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 I am a policy wonk. I look like one. I love writing policy, although it makes no sense to most normal human beings. Have you ever been to a policy discussion? Brother Chairman, I would like to suggest that paragraph two will be improved if we insert a comma after the second sentence. I so move, Brother Chairman. No, I second it, Brother Chairman. Uh, chairman wanted to rule it out of order, but it was too late. All right, uh, and 50 people get in line at each microphone. Brother Chairman, I want to speak against the motion. If we add a comma, we're going to destroy the initial meaning of the paragraph, which has legal implications for the future of the denomination here in the United States, not to speak of what Parliament will do to this in Canada. The Bermudans have suggested that this, they can work through it, but we're going to really mess it up. I speak against the motion. Okay, over here, I speak in favor of the motion. The comma helps clarify the intent, Brother Chairman. This is my training. To, thank you forever and ever. Amen. And then oh, we're into this for 40 minutes, and finally the chairman says, I think we're ready to vote. Okay, all in favor of adding the comma as per the motion, say aye. Aye. All in opposed say no, no, we're going to need secret ballot. Please pass out the papers, appropriately fill them out. Okay, I want my people to collect the papers. Uh, now we're into it. 
In the opinion, okay, it is 87 in, uh, against the motion and 13 in favor of the motion. The motion has failed. We will not add a comma. How'd you feel about yourself listening to that testimony? That is a policy discussion. That is the United States Congress. That is the General Conference. That is the North American Division Executive Committee. Don't you feel good? Now, you should see what happens when we enter a topic that truly damages the hearts of people in churches, 6,000 churches across North America, and we're arguing in the same committee. And I turn to the lawyers, why are we talking about this? This is frivolous. This is a nothing issue, yet we're hurting innocent people across the land. So it's a big deal that a lawyer approached Jesus, which is the greatest commandment. And what does Jesus answer? You will love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. The second is like unto it. You will love your neighbor as yourself. Any questions? So where's the love chapter in the Bible? Shout it out. One, two, three. Uh, wrong answer. It's not 1 Corinthians 13. Jesus just indicated which is the love chapter in the Bible. I'm going to give you one more shot. The love chapter in the Bible is? The love chapter in the Bible is Exodus 20. You see how wrong we have been? You see how mistaken we have been? Here it's Jesus. This is Jesus singling out the Ten Commandments of loving God and loving your neighbor. That is the law and the prophets. But we think it's a list of rules that you better obey, even though we have no clue what obeying them means. Jesus defined in legal terms that this lawyer walked away dumbfounded. You will have no other gods before me. Why not? Because they don't exist. Any god that you put before me, you invented him. It could be your truck for Pete's sake. People invent gods all the time. Others have themselves. Nebuchadnezzar made a statue look just like him. And so God said, don't have another god because there is no other god. I love you. Remember, remember the, the Bible says that we are his bride? Sisters get that. Guys really struggle to wrap their minds. I, I, I'm the bride of Christ. This is not a testosterone approach to teaching me something. We are the bride of Christ. Right, ladies? And, okay, we're, we're something really special to him. All right, gentlemen? We're something so special that the best way to understand it was that day when you looked at your bride. Remember? Oh, that's how he looks at us. Okay, that, that describes what? Love. You, you, you will ha have no gods before me, thank you. You don't need to make a statue and pray to it. You know why? You could just talk with me. Why make a statue that looks just like me and you're talking? Can you help me? I'm here. Why are you talking to a statue? Hello? Why do I need to make a statue of Ruthie, my wife? I could just, isn't that what wives tell their husbands all the time? I'm here. Please talk to me. What do we always say? You know I always talk to you. I see elbowing going on. Are you listening? This is, are you listening? It's as if he knows us. Don't make statues of anything in heaven, on earth, or in the water. And You have me. Talk with me directly. The power of prayer. To be able to address the creator of the universe directly without anything in between to interrupt it. The third, don't take my name in vain. Why would you mess with someone who loves you so much? In these United States of America, even our cursing and swearing includes the name of God and his only son, Jesus Christ. We debase him. Are you aware that in Israel, El Elohim Chad Yisrael Baruch Hashem Adonai. The Lord is our God, the God of Israel. Baruch Hashem Adonai. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And you put your hand over your heart. 
Blessed be the name of the Lord. Baruch Hashem Adonai. And when the rabbi says that, the congregation says, Baruch Hashem. Blessed be his name. There are still cultures who actually bow their head and say, Blessed be his name when they hear the name of God. Amen. We cuss his name. What is cussing? Add the R where it's supposed to be. It's cursing. We curse his name. Don't curse the one who loves you so much. You see, it's about love. And then, you know what? You got six days to take care of business. Not business. Business. B-I-D-N-E-S-S. -S. Take care of business. But the seventh day, I'm asking you out. Ruthie and I have been married 37 years. And all 37 of those years, she shared me with the planet. All six continents, over and over. So when I get home, Tuesday is our day. Don't you call. I don't answer. Except when it says something that you better answer that. And I get her blessing and her command, and then I obey. Tuesday is our day. We go out. She dresses up. She takes time. Puts on those blue shoes I love. Mm -mm -mm -mm. We won't go any further, but just let's leave it at that. I love it. <laughs> she wear those blue shoes. Thank you, Jesus. Mm. And she take time on her hair. She's one of those that has the, 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 the frizzy hair, and it takes time to straighten it and cook it, you know, and getting it. And, and if it drizzles, <laughs> you know, so it, that means umbrella. That means a fuss just to get her to the van. Because if it drizzles on there, she would go crazy in Portland. Because <laughs> frizzy hair just doesn't do drizzle. And there are sisters here who understand that burden. And others of you with straight, straight hair, I don't get it. What's the, oh, don't worry. And so, so she's off. And then she almost, wait, wait. Please do not judge my wife. She's gorgeous. And, she, and in the van, she's still finishing up. Because we're going out. It's Tuesday. And we go to Subway Sandwich. <laughs> we splurge. We're going to spend money tonight. We get the foot long. Each of us. Thank you, Jesus. And when we got out of the van, she expects the door to be open like when we dated 500 years ago. I run around the van, it could be snowing, it could be rain, it does not matter what I look like when this thing's over, but I better have that door open and have my golfer's umbrella, the one that opens up almost like the patio umbrella that you have at the store. And, and I walk with her, and if there's a puddle, something is going to have to happen for her to get past that. And in the middle of the parking lot, she wants her kiss, and she doesn't care who's watching. If I forget... The dog and I will be sleeping outside tonight. <laughs> I want my kiss. I want my hug. I, I, I want to be held, right? There's a difference between being held and being hugged. I want you to hold me. And tell me that you love me. And I want to know you love me. Sisters say they understand that stuff to a guy. You know I love you. No, I don't. Show me. And when we kiss, you don't want any cameras around because you don't know which side the mustache belonged to. There's just a bunch of hair in between us. I know, that's so unnecessary. That is gross. I know, I know. But this poor woman said, I do to me. Am I being transparent about our Tuesday? And, and then we get to Subway Sandwich. We've been going to the same one for almost 25 years. This is the third generation of kids working in there. There they come. <laughs> there they come. Uh, uh, good evening. How can we help you? They know what we're going to ask for. I go right up there. I want the foot-long wheat flatbread. <clears throat> I want the, uh, the, what do you call it? The veg, what? The veggie delight. And they know I'm going to put 10 pounds of spinach in there, and they won't know how to fold it. And 30 pounds of jalapeno peppers. Amen. <laughs> with a sort it's basically a salad with flatbread. But I apologize to no one because I'm with my woman. Mm -mm. Mm -mm 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 -mm. 
And they see us holding hands, and she wants to swing the hand in the parking lot. I want to feel like a little girl when I'm with my man. And we get in there, we order our sandwich. We call it sandwich. S-A-M-I-C-H. Sandwich. So you get, what do you want, babe? You know my sandwich. And so we even have our little twang, our little language that nobody, shh, don't tell anybody. I wasn't, and my wife's going to say, I can't believe you told everybody. Sandwich is our thing. Anyway, sandwich. And we sit there finger tipping while we talk about our children. And I tell her, Every time I want to remember how much I love you, I just have to look at our kids. Your light shines in their eyes. And it has to come from here. She'll know if I'm faking it. Right, ladies? She wants it for real. This is a romantic. Gentlemen, don't be afraid to bring romance back to your home. Romance your woman. Take care of her. Show her that she's still everything to you. And if you've fallen out of love, fall back into love. You can love again. The Bible says you can go back to your first love experience. And then we finish eating. Do you think we have anything to take home? No, we killed the whole foot long savagely on the table. And we only drink bottled water because we are seeking a healthy lifestyle. (laughs) By the time we walk out, she slows down and wants our hands to swing freely in the parking lot, and the kids look, look at those two old people, man, it's like weird, (laughs) like grandparents or something, isn't that awesome that kids can see an older couple in love, what's wrong with being in love with the woman who has given it all to share me with the world, I called her tonight, she's better, thank you for your prayers. She was, she was in the middle of her albuterol treatment. I'm doing a lot better. And I went to the baptism, and it was great. And I came home. Okay, I think I better let th- I better finish. Tell everybody thank you for praying for me. Anyway, my wife and I go out on. One day, I got a phone call. My wife said, you better answer that. It says president. (laughs) Okay. Yes. Ah, uh uh-huh. There's going to be a roundtable symposium live on 3ABN and Hope Channel. It's going to be Elder Ted Wilson. It's going to be Elder so-and-so and and Elder so-and-so, and and they want me? Yes. They need a sociologist at the table to talk about the secular world and its effect on evangelism for today. It's going to go live worldwide. We need you on this roundtable discussion. Wow, I'm already scared. When is it? Next Tuesday. I'm sorry, but I got an appointment that I'm not going to cancel. May I remind you this is the president of the general conference? Yeah, but I'm not married to him. (laughs) He doesn't do his nails to match his shoes. <laughs> My girl does. Ted and I are very close friends. I, I said, I'm sorry, but Tuesday belongs to Ruthie. It's not up for discussion. I wish you guys God's blessing. And I missed it. Why? Because I got my woman. Tuesday is our day. It's not about what we're prohibited from doing. It's not about what's inappropriate on that day. That day is Ruthie and me. That is our day. God says, Saturday, I'm asking you to spend the day with me. It's not about prohibition or what's appropriate or inappropriate. Let's have our weekly date together. Let's fellowship Because I love you. Please love me back. Now, I'm not going to ask for hands, but how many wives have caught their man looking? (laughs) Don't raise your hand. Actually, some sister walked by and he... And what did you say to him? You're looking. What did he say? No, I wasn't looking. All men lie. Well, someone said, 
99% of men will admit to you that they look. The other 1% are liars. <laughs> and every woman's heart gets broken when she catches her man looking. And she'll say, I gave you four kids. What are you looking around for? You have me at the house. You have me whenever you want. Intimacy is guaranteed. What are you looking around for? You have me. Can you hear the Lord? You have me. What are you looking around for? For other gods. You have me. I love you. I created you in my image. You have me. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Any questions? It's about love. Then the love your neighbor as yourself. Honor your father and your mother so that your... Jesus said this is the first one that has a promise attached to it. My parents are nearing the end of their journey. I thank God the privilege I've had. But I know the time is short. A lot of emergency trips to Ukiah. And uh, three of them in just the last month. Hospitals are now doing us favors and keeping us informed of stuff. And, but just two years ago, I took my family to Ukiah. We, we, we've crossed from Washington, D.C. 29 times to come and see family in California by ground. I've gotten to see every state in the Union in the lower 48 on the ground. Well, I've seen all of them. I've, anyway, I travel too much. Anyway, so... We get up to Ukiah, my dad tells my, my children, you know, my grown kids, why don't we go to the river? Because we like to put a watermelon in the cold, cold water. It's 115 degrees, but you throw a watermelon in the water, you're going to get fixed up in about 15 minutes. And as we're getting there, the canyon's full of boulders. It's about 120 down in there. And my dad says, why don't you park by the river, son? Dad, the tree's over here. The sun's going to finish cooking my van. I mean, the dashboard, right, gentlemen? It's going to crack with this kind of heat, and I don't got a cover on it. Son, park by the river. Dad, the tree, it's a giant willow. I mean, it's perfect for the van. Park by the river. Dad, where did I park? Under the tree. My grown kids are in the back. This is serious. And when we got under the tree in this perfect shade for my van, my dad turns to my kids. All right, kids, get out. Oh, yeah. Oh, we'll join. Yeah, mijita. We'll be right there. You stay right there. Okay, get out. Get out. <laughs> and you know when they close the doors, zzz, poof, zzz, poof. you know that deafening silence that you can feel? And my daddy turns to me and he says, don't you ever lack respect for your father again in front of my grandchildren. Yeah, dad. Oh, no, no, don't you. Yeah, dad. Me, you shut up. He was so hurt. Uh, around. I don't know who you are, Elder Rojas. I don't know what all they call you out there. Around here. You're my boy. And I'm your father. And I'm not going to be around much, around much longer. I'm all you're going to have. You understand, boy? Yes, sir. So you be quiet. I don't need any of your flowery sermons right now. I'll slap you, boy. My dad was so hurt. Do you blame him? I defied my daddy. Now, you're a grown man. You'll be a grandfather very soon. Whenever your kids decide to have babies, they've been married, but there they are. But you know, son, you're under no obligation to obey me, but you will honor me. You understand, young man? Yes, sir. All right, then. Let's go. But don't you ever do this to me. Yes, sir. And as we get out and he opens his walker, I ran around to help him. No, no, you stay away from me. And as he pushed his walker, it sank into the sand. And he couldn't quite get his first step. Took him almost half an hour to go the 35 feet to the river. Why did he want to park by the river? Because he knew his walker couldn't do it in this kind of sand. And my thick head tried to protect my stupid van. It broke my heart to realize I'm still capable of hurting my daddy. Who of us is good? Always be willing to learn another thing. Here I am, an older guy now, and I know some of you are wondering why I call myself an older guy when you're 30 years older than me. But others are saying, yeah, he is an older guy. Here I am, a guy who can't be called young anymore, still learning. 
from my daddy. <laughs> Honor your mother and your father. Love them. Because they're not always around for long, right? Those of you who've already laid your parents to rest very painfully and bitterly into a grave, you know what I'm talking about, right? Others of you have been through the traumas of missing your parents, and there's that one person you love like a mom, you love like a dad. Honor them. And then the next co uh, commandment, don't steal. Any questions? I've been robbed over and over and over. Door kicked in. Everything that wasn't bolted down was stolen in less than 20 minutes. My house was empty. My three Toyotas were stolen seven times apiece because the gang's initiation said you had to steal three cars, and I had three Toyotas. I put them together over and over. I don't know why the street has mistreated me. Don't steal. If it's not yours, leave it alone. Don't commit adultery. I have a piece of counsel, and it comes from the Lord. If she's not yours, please don't touch her. Leave her alone. She ain't yours. If he ain't yours, please keep your hands off of him. You know why? Because a psychological bond occurs. My wife says, the moment you do three things, you share an intimacy like favorite color, your birthday, or the favorite thing you like to do. He has no business knowing what your favorite color is. Number two, after sharing an intimacy, you look into each other's eyes. I, I like lavender. Then the killer, touch. Let's pray. Now that's all you're thinking about, her, and she's only thinking about you. Bonding has occurred. You actually think you're in love. You end up having a whirlwind affair. You promise you're going to leave your family. But you never can because you love your family. You thought you loved somebody, but you bonded with them without loving them. So God is trying to preserve you from trauma. If they're not yours, leave them alone. Now, if you fall and I have good news. If you have this trauma in your background, the, the Lord is faithful, is just. He will forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Don't let him go until he blesses you. And uh, um, another commandment is don't bear false witness against your neighbor. You know what that is? Gossip. And we practice that. One. Some people say, I keep all ten commandments. No, you don't. You're the lead gossiper in this church. We should give you an honorary doctoral degree in gossip. You have 20 dissertations down, heavy, scientific level gossiping. It's in the internet. I read stuff about me in the internet that was shocking, that I met with so-and-so and that they're in Rome and that I was placed in the GC. This is not true. It is. That means you were put there by Rome. I don't, I wasn't. It's in the internet. <laughs> See, that's bearing false witness. And gossip destroys entire congregations. Wars between nations have been caused by gossip. Don't gossip. If it's not good, don't repeat it. And the other one is don't covet. And we always leave it. Yeah, amen, I don't do that. Oh, yes, you do. You know the biggest thing we covet in the church is happiness. Oh, she bugs me. She's always happy. You covet someone else's joy. Come over here so I can slap you. Why? You're laughing too much. People covet joy. People covet success. Your Christmas program came out perfect. The kids performed. They did this. They did that. Oh, she thinks she's all that. You, you, you did well, and somebody's coveting your success. Rejoice with those who rejoice, the scriptures say. Weep with those who weep. Pray for those who are lonely. The brokenhearted mend them. You see, brothers and sisters, the first four commandments are love the Lord your God with all your soul, with all your heart, with all your mind. And the last six commandments are love others made in the image of God. So what's the love chapter in the Bible? Exodus 20. So then the Lord, after graffitiing this on the wall up there, the Lord cuts it into tablets. I'm not sure they were beautifully rounded top tablets. I think it's just... Why don't you take these down? That they may know that I am their God and they are my people. 
He's describing a love relationship. Okay, so then, what is hypocrisy? I don't know. I'm tired. Quit quizzing us. I don't even know my name right now. There will be a quiz on Monday. We used to think hypocrisy is say one thing and do another. Isn't that right? We, we accuse our politicians of hypocrisy, don't we? That's not hypocrisy. That's just outright lying. Other times, it's not lying. I could tell you I'm going to be to your house by 8 o'clock, and on my way to the house, I blow a tire, and I don't have a spare. And by the time I get off the highway and, and get into town and buy another tire and take it back, I, I, I don't get to your house to 1030. Am I a hypocrite that I said one thing and did another? No, I blew a tire. So what is hypocrisy? Jesus confronted the scribes and the Pharisees with tears. Scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, you pray on street corners and, and you, 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 you fast twice a week and you give tithes and, and you want to be noticed to the people. Scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, you, you do everything correctly and, and eat cumin and other, other uh, uh, herbs and spices. Scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. He's describing hypocrisy. The, the priests are doing all the right things for the wrong reasons. That is Jesus' definition of hypocrisy. Doing the right thing for the wrong reason. You know what the wrong reason is? When you don't love. Now, we've seen the love chapter. What's the love chapter in the Bible? Exodus 20. Now, let's go to the hypocrisy chapter of the Bible. 1 Corinthians 13. Look with me. Am I flipping something on his head for you? I hope I'm totally destroying your concepts. Don't get mad. You're allowed to be confused. I must, in the name of Jesus, challenge our suppositions because whatever we've been doing has not worked. We've been doing something off. May I humbly make the following suggestion. 1 Corinthians 13 is the hypocrisy chapter of the Bible. Notice with me. 1 Corinthians 13, beginning with verse 1. Even if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, if I don't have love, I'm just a hypocrite. I'm just a sounding brass, a tinkling cymbal. Verse 2, and if I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, then that's not like an Adventist, so that I could remove mountains. If I don't have love, just a hypocrite. I'm nothing. I'm doing all the right things. I have the Holy Spirit. I've got spiritual gifts. I can talk like an angel if I don't have love. It's hypocrisy. It's nothing. Verse 3. And I, even though I bestow all my goods uh, uh, to, uh, to feed the, the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and if I don't do it with love, I'm just a hypocrite. It profits me nothing. What is hypocrisy? I will submit to you tonight. When you do the right thing for the wrong reasons which means when you do the right thing without love. And so then verse 4 defines a child. Remember when Jesus says when you are like a child, you'll be saved? Unless you are like a child. Look at the next few verses. Love suffers long. You can actually see a child being described. Love suffers long and is kind. Love envies not love does not brag love uh, uh, it does not brag of itself is not puffed up does not behave unseemly does not seek her own is not easily provoked thinks no evil isn't that a child rejoices not in iniquity but rejoices in the truth bears all things believes all things hopes all things endures all things Love never fails. That is like a child. A child's love is pure. You have to grow up to become corrupt. 
We are currently facing crisis in the United States of America. And this battle will be won in our children's classrooms. If our kids have principles to grow by, we'll get through this, folks. I see two different types of hate going on right now. One is prejudice, which I consider respectfully ignorance. And the other one is open racism. Prejudice to me is, well, this is how I was raised. You mean it's not true? Oh, I just thought that was, oh, I didn't know. See, you can educate prejudice. Racism is willful, we're superior. You guys aren't. And we, bought, we have both going on in every direction. There is no one race that's pure right now. Everybody's mad at everybody. And everybody thinks they have the answer. Folks, this is not a time for hypocrisy. We need, we need to do the right thing, but with love. But when we go to our churches, and our children see us do the right thing without love, this is not appropriate on Sabbath. Who knows what proper Sabbath observance is unless they're in love with the Lord, the Lord of the Sabbath? Is it really your date with God or a, a day that you're not supposed to do anything except sleep? You, that is a proper allowed thing between 2.30 and 6. <laughs> Amen. But pretty much everything is improper and not allowed. We have made bizarre lists of what is proper and improper. That is not from the Lord. That is the traditions of men. Underscore men. Sisters don't tend to make those kinds of rules, although there are a few exceptions. Men make up a lot of stuff and then claim this is what God says. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and love people made in his image just like you love yourself. And if you want to understand what hypocrisy is, do the right things, but do them with love. Because if you don't love while you're doing the right thing, you're just another hypocrite. Is this clear? I've kind of flipped it on its head. I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry. I want you to look at Scripture with new eyes because you are leading the most precious resource in this planet, our children. We're down to the end, folks. Prophecy said this day would come, and we're not about to lose our kids in the midst of this. We are told that an army of youth would rise. We need men and women of courage, men and women of character. Now, I served on General Colin Powell's team when we launched the Alliance for Youth. This great man who has served presidents since 1972, and, and he gave it all up after being Joint Chiefs of Staff and Secretary of State to launch an alliance for youth because we discovered in research, I'm a guy who did gang intervention for the last 50 years. Well, not quite as many, but it feels that way. Once a kid is almost gone and we don't give up, it's one kid at a time in and out of prison. But you know what? He said in his research, he found that if a child is reading at proficiency by the third grade, they are 82% less likely ever to get involved in crime and actually go to college. Of any race, of any culture, of any, uh, of any economic strata, if a kid can read by the third grade, they have their greatest shot at life. Why? Because up to grade three, you're learning to read. After grade three, starting with grade four, you read to learn. So up to grade three, you're learning how to read. You're learning syntax, sentence structure. You're learning what a, a subject and a predicate are. But by fourth grade, the teacher starts saying, read the directions and then answer the questions. And kids struggle in fourth grade. Elementary school teachers, yeah. That's why I went to the fifth grade. That was quite a transitional class. It was easier by the fifth grade. See, because they're going from learning to read to now reading to learn. And an appalling number of inner city kids never learn to read and they graduate from high school without any major proficiency in reading. That's why they only write graffiti and sell drugs because they have no dignity. But if that child can read at proficiency, so the Adventist Church launched 70, 70 tutoring centers for big brother, big sister relationships of Adventist young people with inner city kids so they can learn to read at proficiency. We were on, on General Powell's team and, and, and uh, 
he, he had all these organizations that, that had signed up to the program, and he says, all right, Seventh-day Adventists, sir, we're happy to report 70 sites up and running and more on the way. 26 cities, sir. And then Powell turns to me and said, keep up the good work. I can die now. <laughs> anyway, he said that nice thing. The one affirmation this Mexican-American needed in life. And then there were others that after a year hadn't even begun their pledges. He says, excuse me, what? And he takes off his glasses. How many? Over a hundred have not begun yet? Dump them. Get rid of them. We don't take false promises on this alliance. Get rid of these organizations that only talk and don't do. We need to save our children, ladies and gentlemen. That's General Powell. We need to save our children, ladies and gentlemen. Well, during the break, we'll, we'll get back in half an hour. I went to talk to him. I said, General Power, sir, General Power, may, may I ask you a personal question, sir? Yes. I almost forgot what I wanted to say. <laughs> sir, why don't you run for president? We would all vote for you. We wouldn't even ask if you're a Republican or a Democrat. We just... We would just line up and vote tomorrow. We wouldn't even wait for election day. You are the single most respected man in the world. Why don't you run for president? Well, and he takes off his glasses. And he rolls up his shirt sleeves. Well, Jose, let me tell you. I've sat at this chair in the Roosevelt Room, this chair, this chair, this chair, this chair, this chair. Why do I need to sit on the main chair? I've sat at all the other chairs. I don't need to sit on the main chair, the president's chair. Sir, can you please answer the question for me? You sound like a reporter. I'm a pastor. So do you report, pastor? No, I just preach. Why don't you run for president? All right. You see, I love my Elma, his wife. And after her breakdown, I know she would not survive the fishbowl of the White House and holding three or four ceremonies per day under the glare of the spotlight and being judged by the media on the right and the left if she wore the wrong thing or, painted, or, covered, or painted, uh, combed her hair the wrong way. Elma would not survive the fishbowl of the White House. And then he said the statement that changed my life. He said, I love my wife more than the presidency of the United States. That is character. We need leaders of character. Leaders who have their priorities straight. Leaders who know that our children are our only resource. They are not the church of tomorrow. They are our last best hope. And you get to lead them. You are the command, adventurers and pathfinder leaders. You are the leaders in those classrooms. You are the ones who get to shepherd the promised army of the Lord. It is time to love one another as Christ has loved us. Set aside your doubts and your beefs, and forgive that which is unforgivable, because people are not going to improve, they're not going to do things better. The devil is doubling down, but so are God's people. Amen. Let's go in. Let's do this. Amen. Do you understand what I'm saying? Amen. Have you been sufficiently shoved today? What's the love chapter of the Bible? Says 20. What's the hypocrisy chapter of the Bible? I completely and absolutely disagree with this man's conclusions. But he's made me think. Ah, that was the point. I just wanted you to think. You don't have to agree with me. I know I'm crazy. But God can take any one of us who's willing to be used by the power of the Holy Spirit. See, a soldier in gear carrying a small arm can do anything when they know why they're on that battlefield do you know why you're on the battlefield that the lord called you to it is time church quit your crying it's never going to be done right in washington do not expect our leaders to get it perfect 
It's a worldwide church. We're never going to agree on anything. So let's get to work at church and do it right there. Our children do not know or care what happens in Washington. Our children only know what happens in their classroom, in their club, in their church, and you are there. Okay? Now, I, um, I don't often eat in these events. Have you noticed? I ate, my first, I ate my breakfast here a little while ago at this table. One day I got to an event in uh, Richmond, Virginia. And I got there just on time for the Friday night meeting. And I told my son, poor kid, he came with me to play guitars. He plays better than me. I just hide behind him. And, and I said, son, after this, we'll order a pizza and send it to the hotel room. But after the program, 250 people got in line to talk with me. And I believe if someone needs to talk, you're not going to remember my sermon, but you will remember the conversation and the prayer time we had. That's my calling. Folks think that I came to preach, but really I came to spend time with the people. Have you noticed me trying to circulate? I'm not a good man, but I serve a good God. I try to give away whatever I picked up along the journey. And, and, then, and I, I finally got to the room with my son at 2 in the morning, and all the pizza places were closed. So I can hear my son's stomach. I felt terrible when one of your kids goes to bed hungry. It's terrible. It's okay if we do, right? But not the kids. He's 24 years old. I'm still feeling terrible. Even the 7-Eleven was closed. That's messed up. You know what I'm saying? Could have done something there. Bag of potato chips. Something to stop the gurgle. We got up for the early morning meeting. I said, son, you stay here. And order breakfast, because if you go with me, you're not going to eat. So I went to the early meeting, I preached, and then they dismissed for breakfast, and I got grabbed by another 140 people. I never made it to breakfast. And then, as they finally had to interrupt our pile there, uh, we have to start the next program. You guys are in the way. Amen. So they started singing again, and I just moved over this way to the curtain and retuned my guitar. And then the, the service ended, and the leaders grabbed me by the elbow. You're going to eat. And they took me to the cafeteria. A lot of angry people. We went into, we'll talk in a few minutes. I got over. They served me my plate. And 50 people came to my table. And I got up to talk with them, pray with them, comfort them, apologize to the ones I'd offended. Because there's always, I wish I could speak like an angel. I wish I knew, I wish I had the eloquence of diction, the capacity to say it right the first time. And my food got cold, and they closed the cafeteria, and the staff took away my plate. And I went back to the meeting. Then I preached again. And then after that, I told my son, this time, go to the room and order a pizza. And we'll be watching a movie, too. Man, we need to chill seriously as father and son. In, 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 uh, in room movie, okay, just in case you had a burden. And so, <clears throat> anyway, uh, uh, I didn't get back to the room till 2.45 in the morning. My kid was already asleep, and a giant pizza box was empty. <laughs> he nibbled on pizza the whole night, and finally he gave up and went to bed. He watched two movies, and I never showed up. And so, so the next morning, I get up early. This is now Sunday, and I have not eaten since I have arrived. Do I look angry? And then I remember Jesus when he, the woman came down to the well and he offered her living water and the, and the disciples came down the hill. Master, a bunch of Samaritans are coming. Why don't you eat? Me? You see that? that? That's my food right there. That, that's my meat. That's, that's why I'm here. We'll eat later. And so finally Sunday at 1245, I was able to break away after my last sermon and People were still angry. Pastor, uh, just a moment. I told my son, run. <laughs> run. It began snowing, and we're running across the street with a 25-pound guitar and other gear. <laughs> I even put the van over here. That way, that way. Pastor, we didn't hear a thing. Keep running, running. <laughs> and we jumped into the van. Pastor, and we drove away into the traffic of Richmond, Virginia. And I said, mijo, I have to find a Taco Bell. <laughs> and I need to destroy much vegetarian flesh. We found a Taco Bell and made their receipts for the next two months as I had my breakfast Sunday afternoon since last Friday. 
Don't ever feel bad, planners. I may not get to see most of you again, so I try to just be there. I, I wish I had answers, but I don't. But if you feel one little morsel of comfort and say, I have what I need to go home, Amen. then I have fulfilled my assignment. Does this make sense to you? Amen. You're not going to remember all my messages. I forgot what he talked about. It was so nice. It was uh, amen, but, I, but it was that conversation, the way he prayed for my Pamela. I'll never forget that for the rest of my life. See, then now you know why I came. I came here to pray for your Pamela. Amen. I didn't come here to preach. That was just incidental to my being here. And that's more important than eating. Now I know they're going to make me stay. For, you know, you're going to stay for the banquet. <laughs> but brothers and sisters, we're in this together. Look at me. Look at me. I am no longer in command, so I'm not in any position to tell you what you must do. I am a fellow servant, a broken human being that clings to God just the way you do. I, like you, wish things were better. I wish just once we can get our stuff together as a denomination. I wish we could stop fighting among ourselves. But you know what? It's not about flesh and blood. It's about principalities, the rulers of the darkness of this world. So, folks, let us purpose in our hearts here right now that as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And don't get in my way because those are my kids in that classroom. That's my club of adventurers. Those are the children that I've been given responsibility for. You remember, did you have to get a background check? To You know who put that in? Naomi, where are you? Come here really fast, really, really fast, so we can conclude. These hungry people have a really sad look at this point <laughs> in their faces. Nolene Johnson, the former children's ministry director of North America, and a few of us were very tight. We worked closely on many projects. And one day, I led the, the team to bring a proposal to the executive committee, the, the year-end meeting autumn council of the North American Division. And you were there. What did you see? Um, what I saw was... Uh, Get close. Get close to the <laughs> What I saw was you and several other people that Nolene and others coming across the straight stage, getting ready to present something that I had seen and thought needed to be done since I had gotten on executive committee. And I was so happy. And I had read their proposal um, that they were going to be doing. And I was like, we're finally going to protect our children. We're finally going to take care of our children at a level that they need to be taken care of. On that platform was Nolene Johnson, Children's Ministry Director, Willie Oliver, the Pathfinder Director. We had the, the world lawyer of the, of the church with us. We had the Director of or Adventist Risk Management, and we presented a proposal for background checks for anyone who works with children in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. There were 10,000 outstanding cases against priests for abuse of children, and we said we are going to be proactive in our denomination to protect our, our children. children. Just yeah. one child hurt it's is not, not acceptable. acceptable. And so what happened after we presented? Chaos? <laughs> <laughs> A lot of unhappy people that uh, basically were against it and uh, wanted us to table it, wanted us to not talk about it, wanted us not to tell about reality that was going on in our churches already, didn't want to hear that there were cases in our churches right now that we were trying to litigate. And um, they went after Elder Rojas with a vengeance. I've been a punching bag in many executive committees. Uh, that's why a mustache is helpful because you can't perceive the swelling underneath. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. We were shouted at. Why are you adding another bureaucratic layer? No, this is not bureaucracy. These are our children. Mm -hmm. And Nolene Johnson, these are our children. Mm -hmm. And they shouted us down. Before you know it, they were in line on the mics. 
you're just adding another requirement. And our poor leaders at our churches, I said, ladies and gentlemen, we must protect our children. Just a few fingerprints and send them into the sheriff. It, 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 it. We, so I move that we table this. The lawyer pleaded, ladies and gentlemen, this is applicable. This is, it could be tailored to each one of the 50 states. I move that we table. And that precedes anything. All right, we have a motion to ta table. All in favor? Aye, 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 yay, 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 yay. And we were ushered off chair of the, the oh, stage like little children. They were like this. Keep, keep going. And and my my chief was angry at me. Don't you ever do that to me again? Do what? It went through your committees. It went through union president's committee. It went through secretary committee. It went through the treasurer's committee. We even know how much it's going to cost. Mm -hmm. And I was in the doghouse. Am I sorry? So you see, we've been on the same team for a while, and I know it's a problem. You got that volunteer, but they have to get the background, and you don't leave, you're just leaving tomorrow morning. Uh, 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 sorry. Mm -hmm. For the inconveniences, we're sorry. But we're not sorry that by the time someone works with our children, it is the safest environment. Yes. So, so I want to thank Naomi, because she was one of the, the fighters who got in there to back us up. Thank you, this is who you should thank. This is who you should thank because he, on the legislative level, he was the one that had all of his stuff together so that we did not have to guess what he was talking about. We knew because he had it backed up. It's like when you say a Bible text and you say where it's found. He had all of that. So it wasn't like, oh, we need to do this proposal. No, these are the reasons why. This is all the background. This is the legislation. He was prepared. Thank you. Wow, thank you. Even I'm inspired by that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Naomi. You see how it works? We've been at it for many years, folks. Do you think I'll quit supporting children's ministry? Let's fight for our kids, all right? Now, you'll be breaking up for a dinner here in a few minutes, but please don't look at this as an event. Look at this as a summit. Amen. We've gone to the mountaintop, and we've looked into the face of God. Amen. Remember Dr. King? I've been to the mountaintop, and I have seen the promised land. Now, I'd like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I may not get there with you, but we as a people will get to the promised land. Amen. See, he wasn't just talking about black folks. He's talking about all of us. We as an American people, we as God's people, we as Seventh-day Adventist people will get to the promised land. Not all of us will get there. Look at me. I'm, I'm not sick. I'm not. I, 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 my cholesterol is normal now. My glucose is normal. My doctor is happy. My cardiac workup was perfect. Only ugly cannot be corrected. Some things are permanent. That's just the way it works. I've lost 50 pounds, not because I'm on a diet, but because I changed my lifestyle. Managed my stress. Quit my job. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. And now I get to hang out with warriors at the front lines with my little rifle in my hand and wearing my boots and geared up. I left the Pentagon, took off my stars, and showed up in a plain uniform. I am a grunt for Jesus to take commands from people on the ground for the last battle. And it's against the darkness, folks. Are you in? So don't be afraid. One day I'm going to die of natural causes. You will hear about it. Oh, did you hear? And he never grew up either. I just, <laughs> poor guy. I had high hopes, you know, but some people only get so far. Others of you, did you hear? <laughs> One day I'm going to die. But this generation of kids is not going to die. They are the promised generation. Amen. So let's usher them. Let's finish this thing. All right? Are you in? 
I'm going to sing this song and for His glory. Once again to planners, I don't know why. I keep asking God to help me preach short, and He refuses to answer my prayer. I accept responsibility for my humanity yet again. Is it in tune, musicians? Okay, that was just a tune-up. Okay. Listen to the message of this song and let it sink into the depths of your soul. Seems I've imagined him all of my life as the wisest of all of mankind. But if God's holy wisdom is foolish to man, he must have seemed out of his mind For even his family said he was mad The priest said the demons to blame God in the form of this strange young man Could not have been perfectly sane We in our foolishness thought we were wise He played the fool and he opened our eyes when we in our weakness believed we were strong, He became helpless to show we were wrong. So we follow God's own fool, and only the foolish can tell. Believe beyond believable, come be a fool as well. Lay down your life for a carpenter's son, for a man there who died for a dream. You'll have the faith his first followers had, and you'll feel the weight of the beam. So surrender the hunger to say, I must know, the courage to say, I believe. For the power of paradox opens our eyes And blinds those who say they can see We in our foolishness thought we were wise He played the fool and he opened our eyes When we in our weakness believed we were strong He became helpless to show we were wrong So we found own fool, and only the foolish can tell. Believe be unbelievable, come be a fool as well. So we follow God's own fool, and only the foolish can tell. Be a fool as well. Come, be a fool as well. Stand with me. Please stand. Don't leave tonight. Try to stay till tomorrow. Can you? Don't lie to me now. <laughs> Try to stay till tomorrow. I know for some of you that's a significant sacrifice. And those who have to leave, I respect that too. But if you don't have to, please stay. There's one more tomorrow. It's in the send-off that troops get their final, their suit up, their gear, and they head off to combat. Don't miss the send-off tomorrow. Are you in? Yeah. 
Let's bow our heads. Here we are, Lord. We are your people, the sheep of your pasture. We continue to come into your gates with thanksgiving, into your courts with praise. We continue to be thankful unto you, and we bless your name because you really are good. Your mercy toward us is everlasting, and that's why your truth will endure till the final generation. It is that generation that you've given us the privilege to serve. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, O Lord, and cleanse us. Prepare us for our deployment, because tomorrow we head into battle. Not to fight with flesh and blood and blame liberals or conservatives. We know who the enemy is that's been messing up our churches and driving our kids away. It's the darkness, Lord. So we're going to go home with some light. So bless us. Thank you for this provocation tonight. That your law is a definition of perfect love. And Lord, to not love, even if we're doing the right thing, is just hypocrisy. So now, dismiss us and bless us in tonight's activities. We pray in the precious name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. look at me, don't talk. You must tell someone what you saw tonight. Please, tell somebody what you have seen. Go in peace.